Hey, Nick here. Welcome back. Here is Chapter 6 of The 21 Balloons by William Penn Dubois. And this chapter is called The Gourmet Government. The Gourmet Government. And we'll learn more about what that's all about and what adventures Professor Sherman is in for next. Oh, let's read uh, this little caption here. This says, The Coat of Arms of Krakatoa. A diamond-shaped emblem in a tropical setting representing the frying pan heated over a volcano, the symbolic of the island's gourmet government motto, non nova sed nove. Not new things, but new ways. Let's learn more. <clears throat> gourmet government. This is, again, remember, Professor Sherman is telling this story um, to the Western American Explorers Club in San Francisco, so it's him narrating uh, this next chapter of his story. I woke up the next morning after a night of peaceful and heavy sleep. I knew that I had slept well and in complete comfort because I am a great dreamer, and when all is well at night, I dream pleasant dreams. On uncomfortable nights, I have nightmares. That night I dreamt I was back on my inflated mattress on the globe, which is his hot air balloon. Um, you can well imagine my surprise when I woke up in a big and beautiful antique canopied bed in an exquisite bedroom furnished in Louis XIV style. The wallpaper of my room was pale blue with gold fleur-de-lis. The curtains were red velvet, each trimmed with a large gold cloth sunburst, symbolizing the opulence and extravagance of the Sun King, Louis XIV of France. I hadn't noticed the room at all the night before. While eating my supper in bed by the light of one candle, I had seen that I was in a canopied bed, but I suppose that my mind, in an effort to put my body at ease, tried uh, tired as I was by the excitement of the day, had pictured the room as the sort of simple American colonial bedroom I had become so used to at home. I got up and put on my clothes. I found that someone had taken away the slightly wrinkled suit I had worn but a few hours the day before and replaced it with a complete fresh one. This was quite to my liking. As I was dressing, I heard a knock on the door, and Mr. F. walked in. So this is Professor Sherman in his very opulent bedroom on this tropical island that up until now he thought was completely uninhabited. And it is, it is, it is anything but. So Mr. F. walks in. Um, we exchanged greetings and I assured him that I had spent the most comfortable night. Uh, while we were talking, I heard the sinister rumbling noise coming from the direction of the mountain. I went to the window and looked out and saw that the ground below had started to move again. It didn't go up and down with the violence it had the day before near the mountain, but rather looked like, an, looked like animated furrows Excuse me, in a plowed field. Mr. F. explained that the ground didn't move much in the village, which was situated as far as possible from the mountain. I asked him why it was that the house we were in didn't move when the earth did. His answer was extraordinary. The Bible tells us to build our houses on foundations of stone, he said. On Krakatoa, we have found it necessary to use an even stronger foundation. Our houses are built on a substructure of solid diamond boulders. Come, he added, I'll take you out to breakfast. On my way downstairs, I noticed that Mr. F's house wasn't consistently Louis XIV in style, but was furnished in the best French tastes of many different periods. I saw other rooms, some Louis XV, some Empire. These are all, like design or architectural styles. As I left the house, I turned around to take a look at its outside appearance. The building was the same as the Petit Trianon in Versailles. This was a, a building at the, that famous French palace in France. Uh, a building which I have always considered one of my favorite pieces of architecture. This was, an, this was all an unbelievable dream to think of finding such a building on a small island in the Pacific. I looked around at other buildings. They were equally fabulous. As I stumbled along the rippling ground, I noticed in this order a replica of George Washington's Mount Vernon house, a typical British cottage with a thick thatched roof, a lovely Chinese pagoda, a building of typical Dutch architecture, a small copy of Shepherd's Hotel in Cairo, Mr. F's French house, and about a dozen other houses all representing different nations. We were heading for the British cottage. We entered the cottage and walked into the dining room where some 80 other people were eating breakfast. 
As we walked in, Mr. F. announced in a loud, clear voice, Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Professor Sherman, the new citizen of Krakatoa. I was given a most cordial welcome. Everyone in the room stood up and applauded. Then the men came toward me, their hands extended. I was introduced in order to Mr. A, uh, Mr. B, uh, Mr. C, right on through to Mr. T. <laughs> the man named Mr. B was evidently my host at this British cottage. He led us to a table. We sat down. I immediately turned to my companion and said, Mr. F, before I become any more confused, if such a thing is possible, will you please start from the beginning and tell me the history of Krakatoa? Will you please tell me how all of these lovely people got here? Will you, will you please explain why each house is entirely different in architecture? Why the two houses I've visited so far have gigantic dining rooms? Will you please tell me why all of the men here have the names of the letters of the alphabet? I've never thought there could be a country in the world so foreign and confusing as to customs as this one appears to be. Mr. F laughed. First of all, let's get some breakfast, he said. We went to a huge table where in large silver chafing dishes could be found large quantities of deliciously prepared kidneys, mutton chops, and bacon which, made up, which make up the hearty British breakfasts. We helped ourselves and returned to our table, and Mr. F told me the story of Krakatoa. Listen up now. Eight years ago, a young sailor now known as Mr. M was shipwrecked off the island of Krakatoa in a tremendous hurricane. He landed on the island in good physical condition, which was extremely fortunate for him because the rest of the crew of the ship he was on were drowned in the ocean. As soon as he felt the earth rumbling beneath his feet, he knew he was on the most dreaded of islands, Krakatoa. He didn't want to go near the mountain, for he knew that the volcanic action of the mountain caused all of that violent shaking in the earth. He couldn't stay on the beach, though, because the winds of the hurricane caused a blinding and extremely dangerous sandstorm which would destroy any man. He instinctively, knew, he instinctively made his way for the shelter of the jungle. He crawled through the jungle toward the mountain, trying to get as far away from the beach as he possibly could. He must have made a horrible time of it. He must have had a horrible time of it. For he was not only being thrashed by bending trees and whipped under brush of the of the jungle, and wind whipped underbrush of the jungle, but he he was also going up and down with the sickening motion of Krakatoa's surface. Sometime during the night, he crawled up on a peaceful plot of ground near the mines where the earth doesn't move. He groped around in the dark looking for shelter and finally found a hole in the wall where the mountain, the wall of the mountain, which he thought to be a cave. He crawled in and slept in complete peace, but in great discomfort. He woke up, of course, in the diamond mines. His first thoughts upon suddenly discovering that he was the richest that he was the richest man in the world were naturally of how to get off Krakatoa and back to civilization with a sizable load of diamonds. At that time, getting off Krakatoa was a difficult thing to do. It is hard to leave a place no outsider dares to approach. This was a good thing in a way because it gave him a chance to get used to living on Krakatoa, to realize that one could live on Krakatoa, and to think out carefully the best way of taking full advantage of the enormous wealth attached to the mines. He built himself a raft which took him a month to complete, because at first he didn't have any tools. He found a diamond in the mines the shape of an axe head and made an axe of this. Can you imagine having so much diamond at your disposal, you could just take one and use as an axe head and bang it on things. Unbelievable. It was a crude tool, but one which never needed to be sharpened. He finished the raft and set out to sea one afternoon when he sighted a ship in the distance. It took him only four diamonds, three small ones about the size of marbles, and a large one about the size of... Oh, he took with him only four diamonds, those three small ones, and a large one about the size of a baseball. The ship picked him up. It was headed for the United States. He told the captain of the ship that he had been shipwrecked on Krakatoa, invented horrible stories about how terrible the place was to live on. The captain, however, needed no convincing, for he had no desire whatsoever to go to Krakatoa. So here's a picture of Mr. M on his own little raft he made, getting picked up to be taken back to the shores of America. When Mr. M arrived in San Francisco, he sold the three smaller diamonds to three different diamond brokers for approximately $10,000 apiece. Now remember, this is in the late 1800s, uh, before even airplanes and stuff existed, so $10,000 would be worth at least like $100,000 today. 
I mean, possibly more. Um, $10,000 a piece. Then he picked 20 families, the 20 families you see here. And using the huge diamond the size of a baseball as bait, lured them into taking a trip with him to this fabulous island. He picked the families with care. Each family was required to have two things in order to be chosen. They had to have A, one boy and one girl between the ages of three and eight, and B, they had to have, a definite, they had to have definite creative interests, such as interests in painting, writing, the sciences, music, architecture, and medicine. These two requirements would not only assure future generations of Krakatoa citizens, but also he assumed that people with creative interests were not liable to be too bored on a small, desolate island. And people with inventive interests can more easily cope with unusual situations and form a stronger foundation for a cultured heredity. With the $30,000 Mr. M made by selling the small diamonds, he bought himself a ship. See, I told you it was a lot of money back then. Mr. M was the only man of the selected families chosen who was a sailor. He proceeded to, take, to make sailors out of all the other men by carefully training them on cruises on the ship he had bought. We were soon a capable crew. We loaded the ship with our families and supplies and sailed away. That was about seven years ago. Krakatoa is situated between Java and Sumatra. It's in a small group of three supposedly uninhabited islands named Krakatoa, Verlaten, and Long. Verlaten Island hides a small inlet of Krakatoa from possible sight from Sumatra and also protects the inlet from the rough sea. We planned to dock our ship in this inlet. We did this in the middle of the night. Our first year on Krakatoa was pretty horrible. Upon seeing the mines, we all became rather piggish. This, there was no way of actually dividing the diamonds except by making 20 shares, that is 20 shares of paper, each entitling its owner to an equal part of the mines. A greedy desire seemed to be in each of us at that time to become the one and only owner of all the diamonds. Some of the families were made up of architects and builders. They built themselves comfortable little huts and settled down to a rather normal way of living. We were sleeping either on the ground or in the shelter of the mines. We asked the builders to make us houses too. They asked us to do it only if we gave them our shares in the mines. We refused at first and then found out, after months of uncomfortable living in the height of the rainy season, that we all simply had to have huts. We gave our diamond shares to the four building families. They made us our huts in return, for which they became the owners of the diamond mines. Now we, had, now we all had houses. We all started thinking of ways of getting our diamonds back. There was nothing to buy on Krakatoa. We lived mostly off the abundant vegetation on the island. The climate is humid, warm, and steady. The earth, due to its volcanic nature, is full of phosphoric acids and potassium, and, and everything grows well here. One of the families opened a restaurant. This was an excellent idea. The four families who owned all the diamonds were anxious to show their power. There was no way of spending their diamonds here, there was no way of getting another country either, getting to another country either, except in our ship. It took all the men on the island to make the sh to make up the ship's crew, and none of the families without diamonds had any desire to take the families with diamonds back to the United States. So the families with diamonds showed their power by eating out every night at the restaurant. The restaurant owners charged a fabulous price for their meals. I think it was three meals to a share. Uh, here is the restaurant, the Tropical Diamond Restaurant, so that was the humble beginnings. In spite of this, the restaurant idea seemed to work. Soon another family opened a restaurant, which was just a little better. And then another house was turned into a restaurant, and after a while every house was turned into a restaurant, and the diamonds started to become equally divided again. After about four months of fierce competition, in which we all became excellent cooks, uh, we found that we each had our shares back, and that we were all considerably happier. This, there was a tremendous variety of cooking to be had from house to house, and we decided to celebrate the regaining of our shares with a big banquet in which each family would contribute its favorite dish. It was a sumptuous affair, and we ended it by drawing up a constitution for the government of Krakatoa. We have an unusual constitution. It's sort of a restaurant government. There are 20 families on the island, each running a restaurant. We made it a law here that every family should go to a different restaurant every night of the month, around the village square, in rotation. In this way, no family of Krakatoa has to work more than once every 20 days, and every family is assured of, the great of a great variety of food. 
I understood now why the two houses I had visited were both apparently restaurants. So I asked Mr. F to explain to me how the families got their alphabetic names. That's quite simple, said Mr. F. There are 20 restaurants around the village square. We labeled them, we lettered them, A, B, C, D, E, F, all around the square up to T, the 20th house. We changed our names. In A restaurant live Mr. A, his wife Mrs. A, their son A1, and their daughter A2. In B restaurant live Mr. B, B1, B2, it's very simple. Is there anything else unusual in your constitution? We have a different calendar in Krakatoa. It too is a restaurant calendar. The months are shorter. There are 20 days to the Krakatoan month, and they are named after the families. A day, B day, C day, and so forth, up to T day. There are 18 months to the Krakatoan year. Each day, of our, each day of one of our months, we eat at a different restaurant. On A day, we eat at the A's restaurant. On B day, at the B's, and so forth. Each family only has to work on his day of the month. That's reasonable, I remarked. But tell me, how did each restaurant get to be so different? You, you have told me that all of the families come from San Francisco. For what I can see and hear, of them they all seem to be Americans. Yet their houses are as varied and as international as pavilions at the World's Fair. We are all Americans here. The international restaurants were built simply to give variety to our days. When in the early stages of our lives here, we found that we could all live happily under the restaurant government, we decided to make each restaurant different so that on certain days we could look forward to having a food which was unusual and good to eat. We, we Americans all have different inherited tastes, so we decided that each restaurant should serve the food of a different nation. We arranged this alphabetically so. The A's run an American restaurant and serve only American cooking. You are now eating at the B's. This is the British. This is a British chop house. The C's run a Chinese restaurant. The D's run a Dutch restaurant. The E's an Egyptian restaurant. You can run through all the alphabet up to the T's. The T's run a Turkish coffee house. And you, Mr. F, run a French restaurant. Um, it's as easy as that," said Mr. F. "Is there a Krakatoan restaurant?" I asked. "Naturally." It is run by Mr. K and specializes in dishes of strictly native foods, odd dishes prepared from the bread of the bread trees, the milk from the trunks of the milk palms, coconuts, bananas, and more exotic fruits, and mostly the wonderful fish which are so easily found in the ocean which surrounds us. We couldn't think of what style of architecture to use for a Krakatoan restaurant, so we invented one. It is made out of crystal glass bricks to suggest the diamond mines which are the island's most guarded treasures. And inside most of these glass bricks we have sealed rare and colorful tropical fish, because for many months they were our main source of food. So look at that. That is the Krakatoan restaurant run by Mr. K and his family. You can see the glass house and basically the tanks of fish they have all around it. Very cool. Very unique. It looked like a house made of ice cubes and fresh fish and is very inviting to eat on K-Day of the hot summer months. What sort of restaurant do the S's run? I asked. A Swedish smorgasbord restaurant. And the R? He runs a Russian tea room. What a wonderful place this island is, I exclaimed. I'm certainly looking forward to I-Day because I love spaghetti. Mr. I's Italian restaurant serves the best, assured Mr. F. What... Uh, have you names for the months of the year? We do, in a way, but the names of the months are very seasonal and depend entirely on the stocks of food we have on hand. We now have a surplus of lamb, so we voted to call this the month of lamb. Each restaurant has been asked to serve a lamb specially on its menu. Today is B, today is B day of the month of lamb, so we're having British mutton chops. Britain, British mutton chops are hard to beat. On F day, my day, I will serve lamb chops with Bernays sauce, or perhaps I will serve a roast lamb cooked with garlic. On the tea, on tea day, the Turkish coffee house will specialize in shish kebab, which is lamb cooked on metal skewers. Of course, our restaurants serve a choice of meats, but in the month of lamb, you can always count on one lamb dish on all the menus. The more I hear of Krakatoa, the more I like it. There's just one thing which puzzles me. How do you get your supplies? How did you get all of the materials to build these houses? 
That was a direct result of the restaurant form of government. We are all so happy here that none of us has any desire to give away the secrets of Krakatoa's diamond mines. We've given up fighting between ourselves for selfish control of the mine, so we've got nothing to keep us from taking frequent trips to foreign countries. We f always go to different countries. We cover up our trail by frequently selling our freighter and buying a new one. No boat of ours has ever been seen in two different countries. By simply picking a handful of diamonds from the floor of our mines, we're able to make enough money in, a for in foreign countries to fill a new freighter each trip with the best of everything we need. The last of our houses was completed recently. They've taken seven years to build. It's been a long and gradual process in which we have all worked very hard. How about me? I asked. I've just arrived here. I, I have no family. Do you want me to change my name? I, should I start building myself a restaurant? I, I hate to think that I'm in any way upsetting anything here. Another restaurant would ruin your calendar. Uh, what do you want me to do? I am afraid, said Mr. F., that you will have to be in the peculiar but rather happy position of being a perpetual guest. You may stay in my house as long as you want, or move around if you wish. As for the food situation, you will simply follow our daily calendar and eat with us every day. When a family prepares for 80 people, it isn't at all bothered by an extra guest. As for changing your name, I wouldn't advise it at all. Since you won't have a restaurant there, won't be any need to name a day after you. Another, reason, another good reason is that the 21st letter of the alphabet is U, and you, <laughs> you wouldn't want to be called Mr. U. Uh, every, it's every time somebody said, hey, you, you would have to turn around. If someone asked you who you are, you would have to answer, I am you. You would keep overhearing snatches of conversation, which would bother you. If someone were to tell a friend, I want to see you tonight, you would wonder what is meant by you. You would keep asking yourself, does you in this case mean you or you. And if you means you and you is me, then that lady wants to see me tonight. And then you'd wonder why. I tell you, Professor Sherman, you is a bad name. I laughed at this and agreed with Mr. F to leave my name alone. Then Mr. F told me he had the most unusual house to show me. It's the house of Mr. M, who runs the Moroccan restaurant. He not only discovered Krakatoa, but he's also discovered ways of making life more pleasant. Mrs. M is a nurse. The children M1 and M2 have very inventive minds. Come with me and I'll show you what I believe to be the most fantastic house in the world. And this is the F family. Mr. F, who's been telling Professor Sherman about the history of Krakatoa and his wife and children. And we will pause there and save for Chapter 7, The Moroccan House of Marbles. We'll tell you that next time. Thanks for reading with me.